Hello from Geneva and the World Economic Forum, and welcome to this Africa media briefing with the World Health Organization. My name is Adrian Monk. My name is Peter Van Am. And uh, welcome to everyone joining us uh, across the continent and beyond. Uh, we have with us from Brazzaville, Congo, Dr. Machidizo Moetti, who is the regional director based in Brazzaville. We have her colleague, Dr. Michelle Yao, joining us too in Nairobi, Kenya, from the IFRC, the International Federation of the Red Cross. We have Dr. Simon Misiri. And in Geneva, we have the forum's head of Africa, Elsie Kanza. Uh, we'd like to hear very briefly from each of them at the start of this press briefing, and then we'll be taking your questions. Just a reminder that we have the Q&A option on Zoom that works for questions that you'd like to put. Thanks to people who have been in touch prior to this briefing to give us their questions. You'll be joining us too. But first, I'd like to start with Dr. Moetti in Brazzaville. Dr. Moetti. Um, to all the journalists who are joining us here, um, I'd like to say a special word of welcome to our colleagues from the IFRC and from the World Economic Forum. Thank you so much for having agreed to be with us today. Um, so we have understood, and I'm very glad that in our discussion today with these colleagues, we'll be able to understand better what is going to be the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic in Africa, not only on the health of the people, but also uh, on the socioeconomic lives of the people at community level in families, uh, which is something that we're very concerned about. And we need to agree together and support the governments how to mitigate these various impacts. So what is the situation currently in Africa now? We have now had reported over 17,000 cases, and we know that around 900 people have lost their lives due to COVID-19. We are concerned that uh, the virus continues to spread geographically within countries and the numbers continue to increase every day. We have um, countries like South Africa, Algeria and Cameroon, which now account for around half of the confirmed cases. So the, the spread continues, particularly in Algeria and Cameroon. And we also have a number of countries like uh, Burkina Faso, the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Algeria, where the case fertility rate is rather high. So we would like to help those countries find out what is happening in terms of case management, caring for people so that the quality of care can be improved and the numbers and proportion of those who are dying can be decreased. A number of African countries in the last week have seen a rather rapid increase in their case numbers. This is countries like Niger, Guinea, Cote d'Ivoire and Cameroon. And this is just a reminder of the importance of continuing to implement the public health measures that we have now defined several times over and over again. Testing people, and we recognize that testing has become a challenge now because of the availability of uh, test kits. Contact tracing and assuring effective quarantining of those who are infected, both the cases and those who are potentially infected, the contacts. This is absolutely important. We know that countries are putting in, in place measures for physical distancing and have observed that in some of our contexts in African countries, this is very difficult to uh, enforce in all the contexts where people are living, as we've said before, in very crowded conditions. But I re really like to emphasize the, impl the implementation of um, these measures for public health. And to also say we need to continue to strive to engage people at the grassroots level so that they understand what is the risk and they are able to figure out how they can best protect themselves and their families and the society at large based on the, on the limitations and the challenges that they face in their families and their communities. I'm very pleased in relation to the challenges of testing to say that we've started to work with the World Food Program, the government of Ethiopia and the African Union to distribute some supplies, including personal protective equipment for healthcare workers and uh, some test kits which are a combination of what WHO has procured at the global level and also another donation from the Jack Ma Foundation. So we are very appreciative of these, of these contributions. Just to conclude, uh, we understand very well that the impact in Africa will be very severe. 
we still have 14 African countries that have reported fewer than 20 cases. And I'd like to very much encourage that we seize this opportunity to contain and limit the spread out of the learnings that are occurring every day from the experiences of countries with more advanced uh, forms of the pandemic. So thank you very much. And I look forward very much to our discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Mati. Turning to Nairobi, Kenya, and Dr. Simon Maziri from the IFRC. Dr. Maziri, what can you tell us about the situation uh, on a humanitarian level from the IFRC perspective? Well, thank you very much, and thank you, thank you WHO for inviting to participate jointly in this very important briefing. Um, we are watching Africa climbing the curve. Uh, you all find it very well. And so far, it has not been in the, in the headlines um, for the world media. Uh, but I think it's our job and our duty to make sure that that becomes uh, also a focus of attention, because this uh, pandemic will not be will not be won over by the world if it's not won in Africa. And uh, there are uh, WHO outlined uh, very well the concerns which we have um, with regard to prospects of, of this situation developing. Uh, it is uh, generally speaking weak uh, health systems. Um, it is uh, general fragility of many, many contexts. Uh, we have ongoing uh, relief operations, uh, disaster response operations across Africa through the Red Cross Red Crescent system. Uh, we have endemic diseases and this uh, disaster comes on top of it. So um, there's a lot of cause, of cause for concern. We don't want to be alarmistic though. Uh, we, I also want to underline that Africa in some ways uh, is um, perhaps better prepared uh, than some other parts of the world. Uh, the African community is better prepared in a sense that they know how to manage hardship. So all the um, measures taken by the government so far, uh, distancing, closure of the borders, uh, curfews in some cases, they bring a lot of hardship. And we are very concerned, and I'm sure we'll talk about it today as well, uh, with the social economic consequences. However, we can see also the greatness of African communities uh, who have for generations developed, uh, uh, developed mechanisms how to uh, deal with these kind of difficult situations and circumstances. And it's our job, I think, collectively to build on that and to support them, uh, not just uh, through the uh, elimination of the virus threat, but uh, with the consequences which will be felt, of course, for a long time. We know that. And so far as Red Cross Red Crescent system is concerned, uh, uh, we work as auxiliary to the governments uh, under the lead of the ministries, in this case, of ministries of health uh, or response committees, very close coordination with WHO, very pleased with that. And um, Africa communities can count on uh, roughly 1.4 million volunteers across uh, all the communities. Uh, it's about 12,000 branches. And these are the people who speak the languages, local languages. The initial phase uh, continues to be on health messaging. Uh, and our armies of volunteers are doing that in local languages, uh, fighting also misinformation. There's a lot of rumors. We learned a lot of lessons in other disease uh, um, work, uh, Ebola and so on. So that's very important. But now it's time to move to response. Um, and we will, I'm sure, discuss it today. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Simon. Um, turning to the business uh, response, we have uh, Elsie Cancer from the World Economic Forum joining us in Geneva. Elsie. Uh, the forum has some 1,200 companies uh, working on its COVID action platform. What are global companies able to do when it comes to helping on the ground in Africa? Thank you, Adrian. Um, allow me to, to begin by sharing um, where we are. As we speak, uh, the World Bank and IMF uh, spring meetings are ongoing. Discussions are, are going ahead uh, with how to respond to the the economic and, and, and financial challenges that uh, this COVID-19 outbreak is bringing uh, about uh, are everywhere, but particularly in Africa. According to the World Bank, it now looks uh, increasingly likely that Africa will face its first recession uh, in 25 years. Uh, and accordingly, the World Bank and IMF are supporting the call by finance ministers in, in Africa and, and their governments uh, for a debt servicing standstill. This is essential to free up uh, revenues which are already uh, cut back due to the loss of, of export markets as well as, as tourism related revenues as well as uh, the shock from the drop in oil prices. So it's really important to free up space in the government's uh, budget so that more allocations can be made to get ahead of the health challenge. 
Apart from that, over the past week, we've also seen more uh, lockdowns, shutdowns, curfews, border restrictions, different measures being taken by different countries, heeding the call by the WHO that you need to get ahead of the virus in terms of testing, isolating, and uh, providing treatment um, to those who are affected. Unfortunately, we're also seeing the negative impact of this uh, in terms of the economic squeeze, uh, people are not able to work, uh, over 80% or so, about 80% are employed in the informal sector. Uh, a recent McKinsey study estimates that about one third of Africans are likely to lose their jobs. This is both formal and, and informal jobs, uh, which is, is too high uh, because we also don't know when these uh, measures of restricted movements are going to be lifted. We're also seeing um, also very unfortunately the impact to the disruption in, in food value chains and supply chains, uh, beginning with the farmers who are able to plant, leave alone sell their produce, the distributors, and here it's not just logistics, but think about shops that are closed, restaurants that people used to go to, um, to consumers. Uh, we often forget that many people were feeding or getting food in their offices, uh, children in schools, um, overall expenditure at the household level has dropped. And uh, so there's a squeeze also in terms of food supply, making a food crisis a, a big concern. So what's happening on, on the farm side? Um, last month, we launched the COVID action platform uh, to support the, the World Health Organization in terms of fostering global co cooperation uh, by mobilizing all stakeholders. And as you pointed out, uh, Adrian, uh, over 1,000 Partners from business, governments, international organizations have signed up. We now have over 25 projects already public and about 15 uh, in the pipeline. The first project was the um, a project that was a collaboration between the Africa Center for Disease Control, Resolve to Save Lives, and Ipsos that are developing guidelines for COVID-19 preventative measures that are adapted to the context uh, of our African uh, nations. Uh, the global guidelines uh, are not really appropriate, particularly in dense, uh, dense uh, populations. And Africa has a lot of urban centers, one of the most urbanized continents. So you need to think about different measures to take uh, in, in the slum areas, as well as um, uh, informal settlements uh, of various types. Um, the pilots were being undertaken in Addis Ababa and Lagos, and we hope to have those uh, reach more countries shortly. Recently, Unilever donated free sanitizer, soap, bleach, and food worth about 100 million euros. Um, and in Africa, this is a global contribution and leveraging the COVID action platform to expedite delivery. And in Africa, we're talking to uh, local partners that have networks that can reach millions of people to act as channels to channel these resources to the most vulnerable um, communities. And lastly, just in terms of what we're seeing in terms of regional responses by business, and here we're enabling coordination on the health front, repurposing of automotive factories in South Africa to produce ventilators. We're seeing repurposing of garment factories in Kenya to produce protective equipment. Um, we're seeing a development of use cases for direct cash transfers to to communities, households, uh, particularly vulnerable ones in Kenya, South mm. Africa, South Sudan. This is important to keep these small micro businesses going. So it's, rather than donating food is how do you enable mm. people to get money and be able to purchase locally. And I'll stop Great. there. Thank you so much, Elsie. Um, and I know we want to come back to uh, look at the socioeconomics of, of all of this. Um, getting a lot of questions coming in already. And probably the top question is the one that uh, Zawadi Madibo from BBC Africa in Kenya is on the line to pose. Uh, Zawadi, can we bring you up and hear your question? I know you'll be well, asking it on behalf of a lot of people. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Um, I'm just interested in knowing um, now that Trump's decision uh, to pull out funding from the World Health Organization. Uh, I would like to understand what is WHO's budget for Africa in terms of fighting COVID-19 this year? And what impact does Trump's decision have on that particular program? Thank you for that. Um, 
Dr. Moetti, turning to you there in Brazzaville, we heard some news obviously coming out about the uh, moves to uh, make good the shortfall mm -hmm. in that funding, but can you give an answer to uh, Zawadi's uh, question? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, first of all, with regard to the, uh, the budget for the COVID response support by WHO, it's um, about $300 million. So in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in the African region, we have 47 countries and each of the country offices has developed a plan of how they're going to work with the government locally. And then we have a regional office team that's working on this. And overall, we will need be needing about $300 million for the next, for about six months in order to support what countries are doing. So this has been if you like, uploaded into the global WHO budget and our colleagues are working at the global level then uh, with different partners, uh, donors, to see what are the resources coming in. I think more broadly, of course, um, WHO is a member state organization and the United States is the number one contributor to our budget. So for the last biennium, for example, we had a contribution in uh, voluntary contributions, voluntary funds targeted to different program areas of about $151 million from the US. And we've already received uh, for this biennium, which is starting this year, almost $50 million for the, from the United States. So the impact uh, potentially of this decision will be quite significant on areas such as polio eradication. We're on the way to having a declaration of uh, certification of polio being eradicated from Africa. The US is one of the biggest supporter of that, as well as other priority programs that address communicable diseases such as HIV, malaria, and work on strengthening our health systems. So th this I, I can describe as the, the extent of US contribution and the potential impact of this decision, which we are very much hoping uh, will be rethought because the US government is an important partner, not only in financial terms, but also it's an important strategic partner. We work with many of the technical institutions in the US. They are important players in WHO's policy making, strategy making, and we value the relationship with the United States. Thank you very much, Dr. Messi. Um, if I can turn to two questions uh, now, and uh, we have Kelly Turner, I think, from the Africa News Agency in South Africa. And we also have Joya Forster from the Deutsche uh, DPA, the Deutsche Press Association uh, in Kenya. So if we can bring Kelly up and Joya up for their questions, please. Hi, uh, good afternoon to the panel. My question today is, uh, what you've seen from with regards to South Africa um, and how they've been handling the COVID-19 outbreak. Do you think that the country has made some smart decisions in the way that they've been handling it? Um, what can other African countries learn from this, um, whether good or bad? As you mentioned earlier, Dr. Moeti, that South Africa forms part of the three uh, of the highest cases. So what do you think that we can learn from this? Thank you. And uh, Joya Forster, if we can just bring Joya in. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to ask um, Dr. Moetti, how would you explain the still relatively slow pace of transmissions in a lot of African countries, um, such as Kenya? I mean, is there any indication that the, this could be linked to the BCG vaccine, for instance, that's quite common across many African countries? Um, and linked to that, um, a question about South Africa as well, um, are you now able to say that the lockdown imposed there has had a positive impact on um, the rate of transmissions? Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Moetti, uh, over to you. And perhaps we can also get a response in French from your colleague, uh, Dr. Yao, to those questions. Yes, um, thank you very much. First of all, with regard to South Africa, which has the largest number of countries, sorry, number of cases on the continent, in fact, that uh, over 2,000, I think it's about 2,400 plus today. The government did take quite strong action as soon as they understood that uh, community spread was starting. And of course, we had been working with them. They already had a preparedness platform in place as we were observing the the pandemic unfold in Asia initially and then uh, in Europe. What they had done, I think they have put in place the public health measures, 
case identification testing, as you know, possibly South Africa had one of the was one of the earliest countries with capacity to test for COVID-19. And initially they were in fact confirming the tests and supporting surrounding neighboring countries with their own testing as they were establishing their capacity. So they did that and then they have done quite strong work on contact tracing when eventually the, the system got up to speed and um, isolating of cases. They have adopted um, these physical distancing measures relatively early on, starting progressively by initially prohibiting closing schools and prohibiting social events, social gathering events, sporting, sporting events, etc. And then they have recently put in place stronger um, physical distancing measures, asking people to stay at home, limiting transportation. And um, in, uh, in terms of following up, there seems to be now a slowing down of the spread of, so the curve is bending. I, th I think this is what we can cautiously uh, understand is happening in South Africa. Of course, the context is extremely challenging. As you know, South Africa is one of the most inequitable uh, societies in the world based on its past history. So we have places where the social distancing is feasible and others where it is extremely difficult. And we've observed some of the, the challenges that the government has faced in, uh, if you like, enforcing these physical distancing measures. Uh, we have information about initiatives that have been undertaken for, for example, homeless people who do not have a home to stay in. And South Africa is one of the countries that are putting in, is putting in place uh, mitigation measures in terms of social and economic impact on vulnerable populations. So we think that what they have done, what they are doing, may be starting to have an impact. I think we need to continue to monitor the situation with them, but we very much would like to also uh, acknowledge that they've taken on a very aggressive case identification and testing at the community level strategy, which then enables them to identify people early, including those who are asymptomatic, who we are now learning are able to spread the virus to others. Uh, so uh, the lockdown measures are difficult and they need to be accompanied in our view with very strong communication with people as i said at the beginning so that in addition to the police or the army enforcing what is happening people really understand because somebody that they trust and believe in is telling them and they believe themselves that this is for their benefit one of the biggest challenges that has been cited is uh, people who work in the informal sector and I, I think uh, elsie spoke about that very well and this is many people in, in south africa so it is very very challenging but we see the government trying to mitigate and to adjust to the situation as far as the um, the slow spread apparently of the virus in African settings and whether BCG makes a difference, we do not yet have the evidence that clearly indicates that BCG might make a difference. I think this is being studied and being uh, analyzed and written about by some scientists. Uh, there have been lots of speculations about whether the temperature in Africa uh, makes a difference, but we've seen that in some West African countries where the virus has spread, rapidly at the community level. These are places where the, the environment the temperatures are very hot. So we need to continue to understand. And we think perhaps some of the measures that had been put in place because the virus came later to Africa than it did in some other regions. Um, and some measures had already been put in place. We think some of the early alerts, screenings that were taking place made a difference in some of the countries. The challenges now are really those of confronting the shortages of uh, test kits and other key items that are needed to scale up and to decentralize these interventions. Mm. Merci, uh, uh, Dr. Moeti. Et on veut aussi maintenant poser cette question en français, peut-être à Dr. Yao. Uh, on commence tout d'abord avec une question de Ryan Nzingui, de la radio et télévision gabonaise. Et il de, pose cette question, évidemment, uh, quelle est la situation épidémiologique actuel du continent africain. Et puis, on voudrait aussi vous poser la question qui était posée avant par Kelly en, en anglais, notamment, quelle est, ou quelles sont les leçons qu'on peut apprendre de l'Afrique du Sud en, en ce qui concerne leur confinement, par exemple. Et aussi, évidemment, il y avait cette question sur la transmission qui paraît être plus lente en Afrique. 
quoique, évidemment, vous, vous, vous avez parlé aussi de la situation d'une augmentation des cas, notamment, euh, je note, dans, dans les pays euh, euh, francophones comme Niger, Guinée, Côte d'Ivoire et Cameroun. Donc, Dr Yao, euh, si vous pouvez nous euh, parler de ces questions et les réponses. Alors, merci beaucoup. Alors, en ce qui concerne la situation en Afrique, on approche, on a un peu plus de 17 000 cas si on prend tout le continent africain avec un peu plus de 900 euh, décès, euh, ce qui fait une létalité un peu plus de euh, 5%. Euh, mais parmi ces létalités, comme a été mentionné plus tôt, il y a certains pays euh, qui ont une très forte mortalité. Euh, certaines explications pourraient être aussi euh, dues au fait qu'il y a eu des décès dans la communauté. Et c'est la, la situation... Euh, euh, montre aussi qu'on peut encore faire quelque chose en Afrique. Euh, notamment, euh, il y a 28 pays qui ont euh, des transmissions, euh, um, qui ont des cas sporadiques euh, et il y a à peu près 14 pays qui ont des cas euh, au niveau de, de groupes euh, de personnes, mais qui semblent euh, tous euh, être liés. Et malheureusement, il y a certains pays évoqués plus haut, euh, notamment en Afrique du Sud et en Algérie, où il y a une transmission au sein des, des communautés. Donc, pour la plupart des pays, on peut encore contenir l'épidémie si toutes les mesures de santé publique sont appliquées de façon rigoureuse et s'il y a une mobilisation entière des communautés, comme la directrice l'a mentionné plus tôt. En ce qui concerne l'Afrique du Sud, l'Afrique du Sud était déjà en mode préparation avant euh, les premiers cas et les mesures qui ont été euh, mises en place semblent porter des fruits, même s'il faut les analyser avec euh, beaucoup de prudence. Il semble que la courbe est en train de se stabiliser. Euh, ces mesures consistent à une recherche active de cas. C'est vraiment une des bonnes leçons. Euh, Lorsqu'on met en place des mesures de confinement, il est important qu'on puisse retrouver les cas, qu'on puisse les, les tester et qu'on puisse isoler les cas euh, positifs. Et donc, c'est une des mesures assez importantes. L'Afrique du Sud étant aussi un des pays qui a décentralisé la capacité de test. Et cette décentralisation est d'ailleurs nécessaire dans les pays euh, euh, où on, on note euh, un plus grand nombre de cas en dehors des, des capitales. C'est vraiment une des priorités que doivent considérer euh, plusieurs euh, pays. En ce qui concerne Uh, le fait que l'épidémie avance uh, à, à, à une vitesse beaucoup plus lente, um, c'est certainement lié aussi aux mesures qui sont prises beaucoup plus tôt, notamment la fermeture des, des, des écoles et autres. On, 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 on entre déjà dans... On, 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 il y a plusieurs pays qui terminent leur deuxième semaine et de ce qu'on a observé aussi à l'extérieur, on commence déjà à avoir des effets dans la troisième semaine. Donc, ceci peut contribuer à cela. Le scénario en Afrique euh, ayant été que, que euh, l'importation de cas et ensuite euh, prévenir que ces, ces cas-là puissent contaminer les communautés, il semble que cette stratégie ait peut-être ralenti aussi la propagation en Afrique. Et donc, on peut changer la figure de cette épidémie en Afrique euh, si on intensifie la mesure, si des moyens sont disponibles, notamment en termes de tests et aussi moyens de protection et si on ajuste aussi la réponse au contexte africain euh, où on a euh, une promiscuité souvent au sein des familles en mettant l'accent sur l'hygiène et en mettant l'accent aussi sur la distanciation physique dans les milieux physiques et, et dans les milieux euh, euh, où euh, cette promiscuité euh, se passe, notamment dans les marchés et autres. Mmh. Euh, et si on introduit de façon contextuel le port de, de, de masques dans ces milieux publics ou bien d'autres mécanismes de protection dans les milieux publics avec une mobilisation effective de la communauté. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Dr. Yao. Uh, we have a question uh, for all of our panelists uh, from Joseph Hinks, Time magazine in Turkey. Uh, see if we can get Joseph on the line to pose his question. Yeah, hi there. Thanks for having me. Um, I have a question about the role that the uh, WHO and possibly also the WEF can play in ensuring equitable ac access to um, COVID-19 medications and to future vaccinations, particularly for uh, African countries. 
Um, should these organizations be involved in attempting to prevent rich nations from mon from monopolizing uh, COVID-19 treatments and medications? Thanks. Very good question. Um, perhaps um, starting with uh, with Elsie on that. Elsie, um, are the WHO or the WEF in a position to actually uh, prevent uh, any of those measures? What's, what can organizations like ours do when faced with uh, this kind of crisis of distribution that may come when we have a vaccine? Uh, yes, Adrian. Uh, again, it's always good to, to build on lessons of the past and uh, coming out from of the Ebola uh, pandemic, uh, among others, um, in Davos during the annual meeting in 2017, um, the forum facilitated the launch of a coalition for epidemic preparedness innovations, which essentially was fostering cooperation and, and collaboration amongst different stakeholders to develop vaccines against epidemics. Um, in the aftermath of this COVID-19 outbreak um, earlier this, this year, there was an announcement uh, by CEPI uh, calling on a new partnership, uh, obviously accelerated in terms of um, asking the different um, companies involved, but there are other stakeholders involved in the, in the ecosystem of arriving at uh, safe, uh, effective vaccines. Um, apart from support from the Gates Foundation, we've also seen Gavi step up and other stakeholders contributing. And so the forum continues to play this role of, of trying to bring on board as many uh, partnerships as we can and to maintain a, you know, an equitable uh, approach to it. It's, it's all about solidarity. We're in this together. It does not make sense to support just one part of the world and not the other as we're all vulnerable. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Maziri, uh, the Red Cross is obviously on the ground uh, dealing with humanitarian crises uh, around the world. How does an organization like yours make sure that when a vaccine becomes available, the most vulnerable people uh, can have access to it? Well, we will not be vaccinating. We will work with the health authorities and our staff, uh, our volunteers will uh, will support the vaccination, but not, you know, in terms of campaigns, in terms of uh, organizing uh, it on the ground, uh, uh, sub uh, accompanying it, but uh, we will not be doing it. That's not our job. Uh, uh, on the equity issue, that's difficult, of course. When you have the whole world uh, affected one way or another uh, with the different degrees of severity, the normal instincts uh, of politicians certainly is to protect your own people, protect your own population. Uh, and uh, we've seen it even in our world when, you know, we have, we have great, our organization is based on solidarity. It is about uh, helping each other in difficult times. So we had even, you know, in the most difficult moments of uh, situation in Italy, um, Italian Red Cross was receiving support from all over the world, you know, from China, from Algeria, from uh, all sorts of countries uh, through our channels. And then we heard that people in these countries were, you know, saying on the social media, yeah, but what about us? We are also suffering in Algeria. We don't have enough PPEs. Uh, so uh, the only way to deal with it is appeal to, you know, strength of solidarity, to the best of uh, human values. I mean, we're all tested during these times of crisis. And uh, we know that sometimes, you know, the worst in human behavior comes out, but in the majority of cases, actually, the real humanity prevails uh, and we will advocate for it uh, with our passion, with our uh, principles, uh, through all our channels, joining forces with the UN family, with the WHO, with the World Economic Forum and uh, anybody else. That would be my answer. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Moetti, returning to you on this question of, of what can be done to ensure that the world's uh, neediest people get access to these vaccines when they come online. Um, yes, I, I think that, well, first of all, uh, we would uh, and we are encouraging African countries to join in the efforts to find a vaccine by being involved in the clinical trials for vaccines. This is important so, so that uh, we contribute from the continent also in the science and, and the research for finding a vaccine. We are encouraging our countries to do this and, and equally to join into the solidarity series of uh, clinical trials that are being coordinated with different partners in which WHO is very much involved so that we, we contribute in that way. And then secondly, I can only say that WHO is very much part of these coalitions that uh, Ms. Kanza referred to, CEPI, were very involved in the work that CEPI is doing, Gavi. There is also a role of um, 
advocacy, which WHO carries out. So uh, at, at the global level, our director general, for example, addresses um, the G7 countries, G20 countries. These are fora in which people can make the correct decisions. We work very much with the African Union and are involved with them, including with uh, the director of the Africa CDC, who is um, a WHO global um, special envoy on COVID-19. Uh, to carry out this advocacy. I also think at the community level, so if you look at uh, the Red Cross, for example, which has members and branches, people of communities all over the world, I think that citizens themselves can influence the decisions of their countries if they are aware of uh, the potential for some of these these uh, commodities to be made available by actions of their countries. We need to continue to strive for this global solidarity, even in the the context of the geopolitical situations that the world finds itself in today, which is very challenging as compared to what's been happening over some decades ago. So in WHO, we very much are involved in advocacy, continued advocacy, working in partnership with the different coalitions and in sensitizing our own countries to carry out bilaterally, if needed, some of this advocacy and, and negotiation with our better endowed partner countries. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, I think we can go to India and to Sonal Jindal from Mood Board for a question for the panelists. Yeah, uh, hi, uh, uh, this is Sonal from India and I run a Mood Board consultancy firm. A uh, few of our clients are the media houses. So uh, my question to uh, Dr. Moete, Dr. Simon and Alice is that uh, before COVID, we were talking about climate change, uh, environmental protection, um, and other such things like sustainability. But post COVID, what is the plan? I know it is too soon to ask the plan, but are we going to talk about uh, uh, the sustainability of mankind? And what is the uh, measures we are going to take for the human protection moving forward? Thanks for that question. And uh, perhaps we can also go to, uh, to Nigeria and Ohi Odahai from Arise TV. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my question is to uh, the WHO uh, rep. Um, talking about Africa, knowing our poverty rate and huge populations, how realistic is social distancing? And my second question is, how long are asymptomatic carriers contagious? Thank you. OK, thanks for that. That's a genuinely busy newsroom behind you there uh, in, in Nigeria, Rohi. Um, uh, Dr. Moeti, perhaps I can turn to you first on that. Um, maybe uh, Ohi's question on uh, how practical social distancing is, um, and also perhaps the underlying question asked by Sonal, which is really, um, there are a lot of other big issues affecting human well-being on the agenda before uh, this pandemic came along. And uh, what kind of perspective do we need to uh, observe perhaps when we think about the pandemic going forward and the other issues that we still have to deal with? Hmm. Yes, thank you. Two very interesting, challenging questions. There is no doubt that social distancing is difficult in some settings, extremely difficult. And perhaps, especially when we, we consider uh, that component of asking people to stay indoors and not go out in some settings in the ways in which, which people are living is simply not going to be possible. And if we take into account the size of dwellings, the size of families and uh, the weather and the climate in some places is going to be very difficult. So it is important that this be understood. It, it is important that the, it be applied in a way that's contextualized to the reality of people, but it also needs to be supported and, and enabled. So I think my colleague said very clearly that, for example, when people are going to the type of um, places where we go shopping very often in African settings, the markets where we buy our food, uh, it's 
very difficult there to keep people apart. These are informal settings where I imagine if you are the person running a stall, you are not going to be the person reminding your potential clients to stay away from each other because in this way, then you, you might uh, disadvantage yourself in terms of what you're going to earn for that particular day. So this is what we, we were saying earlier about uh, perhaps there the need to consider additional protections, the use of masks for people going out to do their shopping while we try to the best possible to minimize the distance. I don't think we should give up on this altogether, but I think we also need to understand that uh, it's not possible for the police to enforce staying indoors in some areas where it's simply not uh, feasible that families will do that in a way that's, that, that's at all bearable. And then it's become very important to uh, enable the other measures, the other hygiene measures that my my colleague already mentioned, and LC mentioned how the private sector is supporting this, making sure that people have access to these sanitizers, to running water, to soap, and are able then to practice some of those measures, and possibly even the use of masks, uh, if if uh, in the house, if it's not if it's not feasible for them to be distancing away from each other within the house. It's something that we have recognized and um, that we are advising governments to apply in a way that is uh, feasible in the context of, uh, of countries. And then secondly, the, the question about the many other important issues um, of life in communities for the planet. I think it is a very good reminder uh, that um, our concern with the response to the COVID-19 uh, needs to be put in the context of all the other important issues that need attention globally. I mean, we we emphasize very much in WHO, starting at a pragmatic level, the fact that we need to help countries or countries need to make sure that they are providing essential health care for other diseases. Otherwise, we will see an even greater impact of this uh, of this pandemic. So we need to be aware in the way of doing the putting in place response measures uh, of potential impacts on the environment and need also to be taking into account some of the basic measures that are being taken place, how to dispose of waste, for example, and continue these as part of, uh, if you like, the integral way in which we live life in today's, uh, today's context, where all of these will simultaneously be having an impact. And I think this is why it's so important to have, if you like, not only the public health response, but the socioeconomic response as well. At the level of the UN, there is a strategy document being developed, which will take into account all these other very important aspects of life on the planet. Thank you very much. Uh, we have Nathaniel Lucanio in uh, South Africa from Business Day on the line. Uh, Nathaniel, we take your question. Just checking to see if we can go to Nathaniel in South Africa. Oh, good, good afternoon. Thank, thank you very much for, oh, yeah, okay, I'm there. Good, good afternoon, thank you. Thank you very much to the panel. And I guess it's just a good, a simple question. Dr. Moeti, you mentioned earlier the economic costs for Africa, how severe they're gonna be relative to other places. And like when you, my question is really about how long in a, in a country like South Africa, for example, where people can see the economic costs, they're, they're quite obvious. We all see how people are like, losing their jobs like in, you know, just in, in, in informal businesses having to close. And then on the other hand, the, the issue of whether or not the, the lockdown is working is hard to, ass to assess because, you know, as you said, because the, because the testing is, li is limited, so we don't actually know. So in a situation where you've got people that can see a huge economic cost, but they're not really sure about the benefits, how long do you think we can actually sustain this sort of lockdowns without actually having our people actually rebel against them? Thank you. Thanks for that, Nathaniel. And also we have a question from Philippe Balfroy at AFP in South Africa, who says that uh, earlier this week, an epidemiologist, Professor Karim, who was advising the South African government, said he expects the peak of the pandemic to reach South Africa only in September. Uh, he's also said that the exponential spread is, is almost unavoidable throughout the continent. And Philippe asks, does this assessment match uh, WHO forecasts for Africa? So both of those questions, and perhaps we can also get the opinions of other of our panelists on the line. Mm -hmm. Dr. Moeti. Um, I, I think the first, the question of how long these um, lockdown measures can be kept in place before they really become unbearable for people and they start to react. 
is a very important one. Uh, and I just like to say that <clears throat> that is why it is important to put in place mitigation measures from the very beginning when these, um, when these programs or interventions are put in place. Uh, thinking about the implications, what are the potential impacts on people's lives, uh, livelihoods, and so on. And in a number of countries, this is being done. We are advising more countries to start off at the beginning with having planned at the same time uh, these mitigation measures that may make then uh, countries be able to benefit from putting these measures long enough to be able to have effective public health interventions that will bend the curve in place. So. I think we, 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 uh, there are a number of um, parameters that need to be taken into account, obviously how the, the evolution in terms of new cases and how the, the virus is spreading and if the measures are starting to have an impact. WHO is just releasing um, a strategy document and guidance on this in the next couple of days that will enable countries to be able to figure out how to uh, program if you like, and how to analyze the impact and whether the measures can be can be lowered or not. And I think it's important to also realize that it's not a matter of all or none. As I said, in South Africa, for example, the, the measures were progressively introduced. It might be that when the observations that in some localities, the situation is starting to show an impact, some of the measures can be reduced while others are sustained in order to make sure that you then don't have um, an upsurge of cases if we do this abruptly. Um, yes, I did see uh, Slim Abdul Karim's presentation, though I wasn't able to follow all of it. And we're asking our country office to also send us their analysis on, on how these measures are going to be what impact these measures are going to have on different countries. In the majority of countries so far, what we have uh, done as WHO is to carry out um, projections of the evolution of, of the epidemic if the measures are not very effective. Um, I think that we, know, we do not yet have an idea of where, when we think, how much time we think it will take if really effective measures are put in place before we start to have, uh, to have a, a change in the situation. I'll ask Michelle to come in on this. Perhaps he might be aware in more detail of some of the projections that our team has been carried out, carrying out on this matter. Michelle, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, it's quite difficult this uh, uh, estimation, and uh, most of the estimation are based on the fact that uh, if something is not uh, done, then you can read uh, all these cases. Um, we have estimation um, in the uh, coming uh, three six months of uh, um, um, mentioning um, about across all the countries in Africa more than uh, ten million. Uh, um, at least severe cases that could happen, but these uh, are still uh, to be fine tuned. Uh, it's difficult to make a long term uh, estimation because the context changed too much. And uh, also, public health measures, when they are fully implemented, they can actually uh, have a, an impact. We have some of the modeling uh, when we had Ebola that did not turn. Uh, into reality because uh, the interventions were stronger and faster, uh, even if uh, uh, it was longer, but we never reached uh, these uh, alarming numbers. So uh, we have to be cautious. There is uh, many uh, factors that need to be taken into account, including uh, geographical access of some of the area. So the disease may take uh, uh, time to reach or may never, never reach uh, some of the remote uh, rural areas. And uh, all these are count as uh, African population, so uh, it's, uh, it's uh, difficult and we have uh, to be uh, cautious. We need to emphasize on public health measures that can uh, um, turn uh, the most of the estimation not to be uh, um, accurate. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And um, Elsie, Kenza, you're in touch with many of the key government ministries and businesses across Africa. Uh, what's your feeling about this delicate balance that's got to be struck between uh, keeping econo economic uh, activity going and also protecting public health? Thank you, uh, Adrian. As, as we both sit in Geneva, you can see that this is a, a challenge in Europe as well. Uh, once you shut down or lock down, how do you start phasing um, the opening up? What we know for sure is that we're not going to operate as we did in the past. We will have to maintain 
uh, different ways of social distancing. We're already seeing that when you go to the shops, when you go to the bank, there's restrictions on how many people can be in an enclosed space. Um, we very much expect that this will be the case uh, in, in Africa as well, as the countries evaluate how they can return to, to normalcy. Um, and if you allow me to just go back to the question around how we take into account other uh, realities, because I think this has a bearing also on, on how you restore some kind of normalcy. Um, just this morning, an example related to food, we launched a, a regional food systems action agenda, bringing together uh, different stakeholders in the food ecosystem to see how we address uh, the immediate shortage, uh, the effects of, of the lockdown, um, how we can uh, come up with innovative solutions to farmers so that they plant. Uh, it's raining. If the farmers don't get the credit they need, the fertilizer, uh, the assurance that there will be buyers, they will not plant. Um, Africa is still a net importer of food in the billions uh, of, of dollars, uh, unfortunately. And what we're seeing in Asia, for example, is negative effects of climate change. So we cannot rely on certain staples to come from Asia because they will not have enough uh, to export, leave alone export bans, uh, supply chains being disrupted by, by border flows. So there are a lot of different elements that need to be taken into account, which is a reality pre-COVID and, and the challenges uh, arising therefrom, but also think about the opportunities. Uh, what's the opportunity of the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement? Um, and so I can assure you that the governments, we had some ministers participating, they're very much on board about how we can collaborate and very importantly, how we move together in the same direction. So information sharing, the role of data um, is also playing um, a critical part. And with all these elements coming together and with the support of, of different entities working together to support the, the African Union in particular, uh, the African Center for CDC and the WHO so that we are coherent in, in, in our actions and impact. Mm -hmm. I believe we will find a way to live through uh, this crisis in, in a much more optimal fashion. Merci, uh, Elsie. Oh, okay. Uh, we actually uh, have um, on the line a French uh, journalist that we can turn to. Um, uh, on vous écoute. Can we bring Roger in, please? Okay, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, merci, je suis Dr. Roger Moyou de Canal Plus uh, Afrique pour l'émission Bonjour Santé. J'avais une question uh, à poser concernant uh, les chiffres et les données d'une épidémie actuelle en Afrique qui sont assez bas uh, par rapport aux estimations qui ont été faites par certains. Et la question était de savoir si uh, c'était dû simplement à un manque de moyens d'évaluation ou si on pouvait déjà parler d'une certaine spécificité qui protégerait les Africains contre cette maladie. Et une autre question qui concernait aussi l'état de la recherche aujourd'hui en Afrique sur le Covid-19. Merci. Merci. Et peut-être on écoute pour cette question aussi ou bien le docteur Moetti ou bien le docteur Yao. Oui. Euh, merci beaucoup. Bon, je vais demander à docteur Yao de répondre à cette question. Michel, s'il te plaît. Merci beaucoup. Euh, les chiffres donnés en, en Afrique euh, sont, sont bas, euh, euh, probablement parce que, euh, comme je le disais tantôt, euh, euh, le, le scénario était l'introduction des cas et prévenir euh, la propagation dans la communauté. Et euh, il y a environ 28 pays en Afrique subsaharienne qui sont encore au stade de cas sporadiques et pour lesquels si une activité, une activité intense de santé publique combinant la détection euh, précoce, les mesures euh, de distanciation physique euh, et autres sont mises en place, on pourrait éviter euh, cette transmission. Donc peut-être et probablement que les mesures euh, prises assez tôt euh, comparées à d'autres euh, régions en perd limite à cette propagation euh, sans aussi sous-estimer le fait que cette maladie a une forme aussi asymptomatique euh, pour laquelle il est difficile euh, de, de détecter. Euh, euh, L'idéal euh, aussi pour euh, l'Afrique, pour être totalement rassuré de cette tendance-là, c'est de multiplier la capacité de tests. C'est lié à la disponibilité, malheureusement, euh, de ces tests-là. On, on en a déjà mentionné, euh, demandant une certaine solidarité pour que ces tests soient... Euh, euh, présent pour permettre d'être rassuré euh, de cette euh, tendance. En ce qui concerne la spécificité, euh, on se rend compte dans les statistiques actuelles 
que euh, la plupart des cas sévères euh, ont un âge euh, au-delà de 60 ans. Donc, ceci corrobore euh, un peu euh, toutes les, euh, les, les évidences qu'on a collectées euh, depuis. Et si cela se confirme, l'Afrique euh, euh, pourrait avoir un avantage avec euh, une population euh, nettement plus jeune, euh, même si on a une euh, méconnaissance encore de l'interaction avec la prévalence de certaines maladies comme le paludisme, comme la tuberculose euh, euh, et, et puis aussi le, le VIH sida, mais ce sont des aspects euh, qu'il faut euh, soulever. Et cela me permet de rejoindre la dernière question, l'aspect de la question, c'est la recherche. Il faut absolument euh, qu'il qu y ait des équipes de recherche en Afrique qui puissent examiner tous ces facteurs-là qui font la spécificité et pour permettre une compréhension globale de cette maladie. Et l'OMS travaille d'ailleurs à encourager ces équipes et ça, cela aussi euh, me donne l'occasion d'aborder un terme qui a été abordé dans le passé. Il est nécessaire aussi que des essais cliniques euh, puissent se faire en Afrique, mais en, fond, euh, en, en accord avec euh, les, les réglementations, avec euh, l'approbation des comités éthiques. Et si cela est fait, Selon les standards, cela permettra aussi mmh. de comprendre et de connaître l'efficacité de certains médicaments ou euh, vaccins potentiels euh, pour l'Afrique. Merci. Merci, Dr Yao, pour cette clarification. Et on tourne maintenant peut-être vers les dernières questions en anglais. Uh, thank you, Peter. And um, final question uh, to uh, Drs Maziri and, and Moeti. Uh, access to sanitation is a cause for concern for many impoverished communities, uh, asks Andre Van Wick from allafrica.com. Um, Andre also asks, are there other risk factors in Africa that your organizations believe would exacerbate the impact of the pandemic and what could be done to remedy them? Big question. We only have uh, a couple of minutes uh, to give answers. If I can turn perhaps first to Dr. Maziri in Nairobi. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, yeah, this is a very big question. Uh, I think what we're all realizing is that uh, copy-paste from what the Western nations or Northern Hemisphere was doing or is doing in response to this, uh, to this disaster is not going to work necessarily in Africa. And Dr. Maite already referred to very complex situations we have in slum areas, we have refugee camps, we have very particular family structures. Isolation is very difficult. How do you isolate, for instance, to protect them elders when they're integral part of the family? Um, so it is all calling for uh, non-standard, I would suggest, solutions. Uh, like, for example, if it's dealing with the slum area, using where and where do our members are doing it. Uh, volunteers going in, uh, they are oftentimes part of these communities. Uh, they work through the youth. Uh, they work through the community leaders uh, to explain, to establish water points, to uh, enhance water points, because water sanitation indeed is a key thing there, uh, to provide uh, protective uh, masks sometimes. Uh, so it is all tailor-made to community by community, and that's how it's going to work. And one other thing I, I want to say, you know, we all want uh, as human beings to know what's the date when this uh, horrible story is over. Um, and unfortunately, it's impossible to say it. Uh, and I think WHO is very clear. So there's lots of speculations uh, when the, you know, the measures will be lifted. Uh, I think what is important psychologically, and here's the role of media, help us to pass that message. It's a long journey. It's not going to be over, over tomorrow. And we all need to brace for, it's a marathon. So... Uh, it requires sacrifice. And of course, the economy is suffering. Of mm. course, you know, informal sector in Africa is suffering. But uh, the other side of the equation is loss of life. So what is more important, loss of life or, or, or economic uh, downturn? And these are the choices which people have to be made, which uh, to make, which politicians are making. And that's what we have to live with for the coming month, that's for sure. Thank you. Dr. Missouri, thank you. And just back to Brazzaville, Congo, for some last uh, words and thoughts from Dr. Moeti. Um, yes, thank you for, for those questions. I mean, other conditions, of course, that, that might, might affect this is um, the conflict situations in some countries in the region where simply the presence of uh, interveners is going to be a challenge and being able to, to, in a systematic way, put in place some of these measures might be difficult. We have 
high levels of malnutrition in some of the countries, both among young children, pregnant women. So these could add to the to the vulnerabilities. Um, but but I'd just like to end by saying, in terms of the difficulties, uh, you know, we've seen in the context of very difficult situations like an Ebola outbreak, people adopt very extraordinary measures that are completely against how they would normally behave. And this has been achieved by people understanding, internalizing, and finding their own way, feeling a sense of agency, how to deal with these difficulties. I have a lot of faith in African people and communities. I think our duty is to help people understand in the simplest way possible, in an idiom that they can understand in non-technical language, what it is that this is about, what it is that they need to do, and then to support them, to put in place those mitigation measures that sometimes go well beyond public health interventions, how we'll gain our, their trust and how they can be part of this response as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Mati. Thanks to all our doctors, Maweti, Yao, and Miziri. Thanks to my forum colleagues, Elsie Kenser and Peter Vanham. And uh, thanks to all of the uh, 170 or so journalists who participated and our questioners today from uh, the World Economic Forum here in Geneva and this Africa media briefing with our friends at the World Health Organization. Goodbye. See you next week. Au revoir.